Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, my name is Ronnie Rillo, and I am the marketing manager for ChemImage. I'll be moderating our webinar today, so as we go along, if you have any questions, please feel free to go ahead and utilize that Q&A feature um, in Zoom and type your questions in. Uh, we will be having a Q&A at the end of the, uh, at the session, so we'll address those at that time. I wanted to give you all a quick background on who ChemImage is and what we do. ChemImage was founded in 1994 and is headquartered here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We are the first company formed to commercialize hyperspectral imaging technology and our mission is to develop smart hyperspectral imaging sensor systems to make the world healthier and safer. ChemImage serves customers in the defense, homeland security, law enforcement, incarceration and forensics, biomedical and life science markets. So I'm sure everyone is looking forward to the information that we have to present here today. So I will move on to introductions and get started. <clears throat> We have with us today, Pete Safran, the Director of Sales for ChemImage, Steve Mitz, the Vice President and General Manager of ChemImage, and of course, our guest speaker, Joe Sweeney. We are very excited to have Joe with us to share some of the knowledge he has gained over his 25 years of experience, both domestically and abroad. He has an extensive and impressive resume, and I will now turn it over to Joe and let him tell you a little about himself and then jump into his presentation. Take it away, Joe. Great. Well, thank you, Ronnie. Uh, first, thanks everybody and, and for joining and also Kim Image for inviting me here to, to see the demonstration today and to participate. As a former SWAT operator and bomb squad commander here in the city of Pittsburgh, um, and, and still currently working as a government contractor overseas in explosive countermeasure missions, um, it, one of our challenges is always new technology and how we integrate that into layered security protocols, depending its cargo, checkpoints, or special events. So <clears throat> I'm looking forward to seeing this today. And, um, and if uh, you guys have any questions, I think we're going to entertain those at the end. So thank you. So, you know, from an operational standard, um, you know, there are drawbacks and there are certainly benefits with the current technologies out there. Uh, probably four of the most popular are the K9 units, handheld explosive detectors, X-ray scanners, and physical searches. You know, with K9 units, certainly the benefits are the reliability and the accuracy. Uh, if the K9 and its handler are trained properly and tested regularly, uh, that standard is always met at a very high probability rate for success. Um, and it has really been the gold standard. Um, it's been accepted in many different infrastructures from aviation security to maritime and also to national security events and special events. A couple of the drawbacks that I've witnessed over, over my career um, is some of the weather limitations. You know, we work in some pretty severe weather uh, situations, whether it be in very, very cold and obviously the extreme heat that the dogs have to be uh, frequently rested and, and, and hydrated. And also the proximity to the targets. Um, as a drawback there, you know, they have to really get up on the package or the vehicle or whatever the uh, situation determines what they're screening. You know, one of the other ones to, to supplement the canines is handheld explosive detectors. Uh, we've used these extensively, not only here in the United States, but overseas. And their accuracy for trace detection is very high. Um, they do have some false positives, but there's procedures to clear those as well. Um, and they're very portable. Um, basically, you throw them in the Pelican case and you can pretty much put them in your car, your, your responding vehicle, and you can transport them anywhere with uh, not much difficulty. And they require minimal training. Typically, a, a day, maybe a half a day to a day, you get familiar with the system, you know how to process the samples, and, uh, and you're pretty, ready, pretty much ready to go. They can almost be deployed the next day uh, with that training. Some of the drawbacks, as probably you folks know as well, it's the proximity to the target. They have to collect a physical sample for the detector to function. Uh, so, it, and sometimes also the time that it takes to detect. Certain handhelds, uh, you know, are longer than others, but it's, it's always a minute, you know, maybe longer. And sometimes if you get a pulse and you got to go back, you have to re-engage the sample and then you have to start the process over. Uh, X-ray scanners, been around forever. 
uh, various sizes, various models. The accuracy and identification here is, is also high, um, but it takes some training. It takes extensive training for an x-ray technician to diagnostic uh, the images that they're looking at. They also need training on uh, t what we call TTPs, terrorist tactics principles, or anybody in that criminal element of how they how they actually deploy their their threat their threatening IEDs or whatever type of um, case it may be. Um, so these personnel have to be trained, and also they have to also practice and get tested frequently to make sure that they're um, they're up to speed on any any type of new tactics that are being deployed by a criminal element. Uh, one drawback is they're, they're way less portable. They're big, um, especially the large vehicle scanners. Uh, they take a lot of time to set up and also time to detect. Sometimes you have to take several x-rays to actually make a diagnostics that you have a problem. So, so those, are, uh, those are coming to high points for that. And one of the final ones is physical searches. Uh, Accuracy and identification as well, the personnel need training. You know, currently I've been working over in Afghanistan on explosive countermeasure, countermeasure uh, technicians and, and uh, operations. And what we found is, you know, once again, the heat, the training, um, they, they, can, they can miss things. It really depends on some of the surrounding elements and, and, and really what their shift has been. You know, a lot of times these are 12, 13 hour shifts, they get fatigued. And sometimes the lighting's bad, so there is the there is the percentage that, that is missed during this type of uh, uh, search. So, and it can also be time to detect. If you have a large vehicle, uh, it can take upwards to three, four, or five minutes to even secure a cab, some of the undercarriage uh, areas, and the, the engine compartment as well. So, you know, and one of the other things too I've noticed with canines is. More and more so, it, it's driven by some certain companies. You know, they really, really try to get these out there because of the demand. And uh, sometimes the dog and the handler might not be paired up appropriately. So, and that's certainly workable. You can certainly address those issues. But um, these are just a few of the highs and lows of these types of technologies. Taking a look at this visual, you know, we've identified some of the technologies and some of the performances and, and, and the, other, the other positives and negatives of them. As you can see, they all have their, their positives that where they perform very well. And, and certainly every one of them also has drawbacks where they don't perform very well. And this is the benefits in your security protocol or your security planning to have a layered approach. You know, we have five listed here and depending on your mission and what your objectives are, you, you would probably look at this list and you would probably pull three or four of them so you would have the most successful outcome of, of your security screen. Uh, for example, you know, the optical imaging with the x-ray, you can see where they can complement each other where some of the drawbacks are is where some of the positives are. Canines as well, you know, so you would develop a plan whether it's a checkpoint whether it's a special event, whether it's cargo screening, to see what, what integration of these uh, technologies would work for you. One of the other things that, that I've been studying on here with the optical imaging is that that can be deployed, for example, if you have a choke point where you have to screen all vehicles coming into a certain area. This can be actually set up quarter mile, half mile up range to where the funneling starts into a single lane. And then it can also detect what may require secondary screening by either a canine or handheld. Then of course you have the human interaction of a law enforcement professional or security professional um, if, that, if that needs to take place. We've laid out here maybe a scenario of just four uh, of the technologies where, as I just mentioned, the op optical imaging can be deployed uprange to really start your first layer of identification. And then if you get a hit, and yet you suspect some issues, you know, you can also concurrently be, be deploying the license plate or identification technology. And that can be a police officer, law enforcement, security person also engaging, or it can also be processing real-time intelligence if there's, a, if there's a heightened threat during the situation. But if you have something there that's, that's been identified, then you have your second and even possibly a third layer of, um, of security with your canines and your trace detection as well. 
So with that, that's just an overview of, of the layered approach. It, it, and of course, it's going to change with your mission. But moving forward, Pete Saffron is, um, is going to kind of take over. He's going to familiarize you with the Vero Vision Threat Detection System and its uses in their cases. Uh, then we'll move on to a live demonstration, and Steve will show you the system in operation. This will probably give you a really good understanding of the technology. You know, we'll discuss the basics of the technology. And then, like we've mentioned in the end, we'll close with some questions and answers. Uh, Pete. Thanks, Joe, and uh, everyone else. Thanks for joining. We appreciate your time. <clears throat> I got to say that it is an honor to share the podium with you today. And, um, you know, today we face unprecedented times more than ever. Uh, the statistics can be startling, and the methods and means by which explosive and narcotic threats are used are evolving. It's a known fact that incidents happen globally on a daily basis. And these threats have drastic implications to our communities and our lives. Safeguarding against the changing landscape definitely requires new technology. ChemImage recognized an opportunity to help solve the problem of explosive and narcotic threats. Working with military and law enforcement, we recognized an opportunity to add another layer of detection capability to existing security operations empowering the user with key information to make more informed decisions earlier in the process. We call this optical imaging sensor the VeroVision Threat Detector. With trained users, the system can operate accurately around the clock. The sensor allows the operator to detect explosive or narcotic threats from a safe distance. We designed it to keep the operator informed with a simple user interface. The system can detect threats in seconds and is easy to transport and set up. So how does this work in the real world? Well, we are looking for residue or small amounts of material left behind when someone makes, handles, or transports bombs or drugs or other chemicals. Residues are generally visible to the naked eye, but the verification threat detector can detect these at a greater distance and in smaller amounts than we can. And since each chemical has a unique spectral signature, the threat detector can recognize it by its fingerprint or color. So let's say we're screening a line of vehicles like Joe was talking about for threats. And there's one carrying an IED. The driver handled the bomb material, left the handprint or fingerprint loaded with IED chemical residue on the car door. The car stopped in the, at the vehicle checkpoint and with the VVTD uh, set up to screen it. So while the car is stopped, the VVTD SWIR camera views the target image and it's snapping photos at specific wavelengths that the filter defines. The multi-conjugate filter lets only one wavelength of interest through at a time and each associated with a known threat in the system's library. The laptop collects the series of pictures of the car in one detection cycle. The computer then autonomously processes all the pixel in every image and develops a signature for each. It then compares pixel signatures against the threat library, like matching molecular fingerprints against a database. When it finds a match, it labels it as a detection. They've reacted to the SWIR light the same way because it's the same chemical. The system recognized the residue by category, types of explosives or narcotics and alerts the operator by painting and recognizing pixels in, in a color and putting a box around it. This happens all in less than 10 seconds, completely autonomous, and the system scans the scene and presents its finding to say, hey, I found a chemical, or there's nothing there. So with all of that said, and all the technical uh, jargon complete, we're gonna uh, turn it over to Steve, who's gonna prepare a, uh, we've got a, live checkpoint, and um, we'll, we'll see that in operation. So, Steve, if uh, you can give us a little tour here. And I'll, I'll be walking you, uh, you folks through the scene. Okay, so what we have is, a, is a, the scene is set up. Um, what you can see is the, the sensor head is, uh, is on the left-hand side. And we have what are called uh, you know, some additional lighting uh, or 
at, uh, at target lighting, lighting uh, displayed here. Uh, Steve's out of the way. He's at a different location operating the system. And um, we'll see what happens whenever the car moves into place here. So in this scenario, just like any checkpoint, you're going to have a driver pull up. You're going to give him instructions on where to stop, put it in park. And during this time, the operator is going to be interfacing with the computer, and we're going to see the, uh, the screen that, uh, that Steve see. Uh, he, he'll share his screen so we can see. So Steve, you want to uh, share your screen? Hey Pete, while uh, Steve's setting up, how long does it take to typically, uh, you know, unpack, set the system up, and be ready at, at a checkpoint, say, like we're looking at? So something like this, I'll be honest with you, me as a non-technical guy, took me about 10 minutes to set up from soup to nuts. Oh, That's okay. getting it up and warm and ready to run. Good. It's perfect. All right, so great. So this is actually what the uh, operator would see or the user would see. Uh, this is the um, user interface. On the top, we have three, three separate buttons, standby, targeting, and continuous. And I'm just going to walk you down the left panel here uh, while Steve is, is viewing the, the, uh, the car. So standby mode, uh, that, that allows the user to go into a rest mode, saves on light bulb life and extends the useful time of the, of the system. If you switch over to targeting, this allows us uh, those controls such as uh, zoom and focus, uh, as well as a pan and tilt and home button. So that's the essentially sort of that, that cursor that you have displayed there. So as you can see, uh, this is live and Steve's uh, zooming it out and uh, looking, looking for that suspect area where material may be deposited. On the left-hand side are, are presets. So the user can uh, add a particular, let's say this checkpoint, have common, check, have common presets where it allows the, the user to quickly move the sensor to the proper location. Uh, in this in this scene, we're going to be looking at the car door. Uh, he's going to Steve's going to hit scan, and it'll pre present us a discrete scan of of that area. And it's going to feed back any is there any uh, explosive materials or any threats uh, on in the scene. And what we found was in this, it's alerted the user that there's urea and urea materials that were deposited on the car door. Of course, we have loaded these uh, specifically for this demonstration to show you just how fast and capable the system is. Um, what you can do at this point is you can hit OK uh, and scan to another section of the car. And check to see if there's any other uh, deposits anywhere else. So again, you know, what we're displaying here is how useful and capable it is, pretty simple to use. Um, looks like whoever's driving this car uh, has something special to do because we found some ammonium nitrate on here too. I uh, hope, uh, hope they're just a gardener, right? Uh, but as you can see in the comments box, uh, Steve's located that he is the bad guy. So the comment box is useful. It, it helps the user jot down any notes about the scene, um, what was going on, could be, as you say, in time, date, weather, uh, what's going on, useful things that you want to remember. Because again, if you're detecting explosives, uh, you want to make sure that you take down as much information about the scene and, and information as possible for, for later use. Uh, what we're seeing here are our detection catalog. Uh, this allows you to put, pull up previously uh, detec previous detections. It provides you a comment section on the, on the side where comments can be uh, displayed. You can also add additional comments if someone else wanted to add information or comments about that scene. You can also uh, hit uh, and print a, a report quite simple. In that detection catalog, you could see, or, or the detection view, you could also see that the type of material that was detected. Thanks, Steve. Then uh, one of the other uh, modes we have is continuous. So if we go back to the car door, see the preset, just a couple quick adjustments. And Steve's gonna click on continuous. <clears throat> and what this will do is 
This will continuously take, uh, take images uh, of the scene underneath that particular wavelength. And it uses a, a thing called persistence. So you might see things pop in and out of the scene. Um, it allows you a quick view of to, hey, is there something there? And if someone walks into the scene, uh, like, the, like the driver may do, what you'll see is this will, is a live update, driver's in the scene. And then if he moves out, you might see some detections. This is important for everyone to note that the system's designed for stationary objects and you can get false positives pop up utilizing this continuous mode or even the targeting mode when there's motion in the scene, such as a moving person. So again, we're looking for something that integrates into your, into your checkpoint um, uh, with, with the stationary uh, targets. So we go back to targeting. And one of the, one of the features here is the ability to uh, swap images. So here you have the target image is now large. Uh, this is useful whenever you're asking a driver to move to a different location or, hey, you know what, we found something here. Let's just take a look at what might be in the trunk. Is there any residue that's left behind? Hmm. Hey, yeah. um, what did you see with the vehicle throughput? Like, how many cars have you done, and, and how does that relate to high volume? It's a good, a good question. You know, we get that a lot because obviously, like you said, um, there are you know you don't want to create a pinch point based off of you know your 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 screening mechanism or, or your technology you you develop. So um, recently, we were hired to assist with vehicle screening at the U.S. Open in Pebble Beach. Let me tell you, Joe, it was tough duty, right? Monterey, California, beautiful sunsets. Um, anyways, during that operation, we scanned over 100 vehicles during a high volume period. The takeaway to that is there wasn't any impact to normal traffic patterns and flow. So their security had it set up in a way that they wanted everybody to have a certain time to access and a certain time to get out. And that was also a trigger. If there's any delays, they wanted to get back in there and say, hey, why is there a delay with this delivery vehicle? That, that raises a caution flag. So long story short, you, you see the time to detect, about 10 seconds in actuality, you know, after some user interface, um, it's not too long. So looks like Steve's set up here. Steve, <clears throat> he's, as you can see, we're, we're changing up the scene there and uh, bringing in the back of the, of, of the vehicle. So another question about that is you want to check another part of the vehicle. So you could you could deploy two or three sets of these. So you could really check both sides at the same time, the back and the front, right? So you could, they can work and help you know, together as a unit. Yeah, you know, and that's what we did and that's what we did out in Monterey. Um, exactly that. So you can have two two systems set up. One could be looking at you know, the proximity or location of the, of the rear of the vehicle, one of the, the driver's side. Um, we've used these in, in tandem with canines at other events like in Heinz Field, where we would screen it while the security person was checking IDs and things of that nature. Uh, this helped the canines so much that it was a hot summer day. It was a, a preseason game and um, allowed the handlers to rest the canines and bring them out so they're sharp. And uh, I know that whenever my boss works me too much, I get cranky. <laughs> so uh, back in action here. <clears throat> we're, we're now gonna just uh, target in on that area of the bumper. So we've, working with law enforcement and other folks in the military, we know that if someone's gonna load uh, a vehicle or delivery vehicle with a, a lot of bomb making material, it's gonna be very hard uh, to not leave any residue behind. Um, so really quick, getting everything into scene, hitting the scan button. And within a couple of seconds, we, we have a, another hit. So one of the things here is uh, if we hit okay. Um, what, what we can also do is <clears throat> we can take another, another view of that.
And again, in a continuous mode, we can see the uh, system operating and bringing up real time, uh, real times, near real time scans, I should say, right? So in about 10 seconds, you're gonna start to see potential threats uh, pull up into the screen. And it's as simple as that, Joe. Then we can home it and uh, we are good to go. Thank you, Steve. One other question, Pete. Yeah. Um, so the operator can actually be 100, 150 feet from the actual screening of the vehicle, right? Same distance. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. And in fact, uh, I believe we may touch on that a little bit in our user, user case scenarios. So to your point, you know, um, whenever we des designed a system, we decided to design it with flexibility in mind. And those three main use scenarios were a hasty checkpoint or entry control points like we just saw, clandestine labs, uh, and also suspect cargo or packages. Uh, it's good to remember uh, that the system is required to inspect stationary targets, uh, just like we showed you and that we need direct line of sight, as you saw in the demonstration. So adequate lighting uh, is also important. And keep in mind that the distance to the sensor, uh, so that, that means where that explosive threat or that, or, or that possible threat from that to the sensor, not to the user, um, can be from one meter to 20 meters. But that also varies in how much explosive residue you have or narcotics residue you have. So in that one to three meters, you're talking about a couple grains of salt, right? And there's micrograms. Again, it's not trace, it's residue, uh, up to, you know, larger, you know, milligram to gram levels as you start to, you know, move away. So a um, lot of flexibility in there, very simple to use, very quick. And in this, this particular scenario, to your point, Joe, it's exactly that, right? Why do you want to put your operator so close to, uh, so close to a potential threat, keep them, Far, far away and give them the information so that you can pass that forward uh, to your other operations. So all of this is, uh, we, we bring this to our customers and um, to provide the best solution that's right for any event or operations, we have a couple ways to implement the technology. Uh, so it could be purchased as capital asset, uh, we'll train and help maintain through warranty and service agreements, or we could provide a screening service solution where we provide the technology and highly trained operators uh, for the event or location. And that's what we have. Uh, thank you for your attention and I'll, I'll pass it over uh, to Ronnie for any question and answer. Okay, uh, looks like we had a few questions come over. So let's see, we've got, can this system detect through objects? Uh, no, it cannot. It, it, it can, it, I say that tongue in cheek. So it's not an x-ray system where you're going to penetrate anything, but if the barrier to the object is transparent or translucent, uh, we can detect it. So again, it's like you need to get uh, light onto the sample. The sample needs to reflect that light and we're gonna dissect it to determine what the, you know, if it's a chemical threat. Uh, can the system detect materials that are mixed with something else? So, so the answer is yes, it can, it can identify items that are mixed with other components um, again, in complex backgrounds, uh, you can imagine if you walk into a lab and someone's mixing up something uh, particularly toxic, it all comes down to, again, um, the right amount of material uh, for the distance to the sensor. Are there weather or climate restrictions for the system, i.e., is it waterproof, what temperature range, et cetera? So we have designed the system to operate in an uh, outside environment. 
and it is, um, I would say, weather related, weather rated in the sense that you know you don't want to take it scuba diving. Um, there are restrictions on weather. You know, it's obviously uh, whenever it's raining or um, overcast or cloudy, you want to have additional lighting. Rain can uh, subdue the signal and uh, make it less uh, less useful. Um, and what the water water band will also absorb and, and kind of cloud up the, the actual detection. So we, we recommend that uh, it doesn't operate in the rain. Uh, can it detect liquids or gases or only powder type materials? So it cannot detect gases. Uh, it can detect uh, powdered materials, as we saw, uh, and uh, and liquids like uh, oils or things of that nature. I believe that is the, all the questions we have. Um, so again, if any of you have any further questions, um, please feel free. Um, so I want to thank you all for joining us today. I really hope you all gained some great insights. Um, we will be sending a recording of this webinar to all of our participants. Uh, but again, if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to reach out, um, info at chemimage.com and just mention webinar in your subject line. And, um, we can definitely help you any way we can and answer those questions for you. So again, thank you very much. And, uh, we look forward to, uh, to sending you out the recording very shortly.